Okay, everyone, before we continue, I want all of you to stop. That is not forward, this is forward. Thank you. All of you, stop, okay? I want you all to think for a second. Do you know the feeling? The fear that your golden crops for which you toiled tirelessly day and night could just be washed away by rising sea levels? The soil salinized and capped, rendered infertile? Do you know the feeling? The fear that the next time you pull in a fish from the ocean, you might find it already wrapped in great swathes of plastic bags, tinned in innumerable cans. Do you know the feeling? The fear that the next eruption from that nearby volcano could send a pyroclastic flow barreling down, burning and burying you, your town, everyone you've ever known and loved? The thing is, all of us here know exactly nothing about how any of that feels. Golden crops, I don't see them. I don't fish the fish, I eat the fish. And as for volcanoes, there are no active volcanoes in the immediate vicinity to be worried about right now. But here's the thing. Right now, someone, somewhere, actually a whole lot of someones, pretty much everywhere at this point, knows exactly how this feels. The very idea that these people live with these and more fears on a day-to-day -day basis and we remain completely and utterly ignorant is exactly what is undermined by the term environmental equity, which I shall get to in a moment, but first let's take a look at the topic given to us. Exploring this idea through expert talk, expert, would lead to creating constructive conversations about the topic of environmental equity, being linked with economic inequalities, related to a class con, you know this is a long topic, I'm just gonna extract the main idea here, there we go. The topic of environmental equity being linked with economic inequalities related to a class conscious world. Now this main idea can further be divided into two parts. Firstly, what is environmental equity in the first place? Well, according to mobilizegreen.org, environmental equity describes a country or world in which no single group or community faces the disadvantages in dealing with environmental hazards, disasters, or pollution. Ideally, no one should need extreme wealth or political connections to be able to safeguard the well-being of their families and communities. Environmental equity is a basic human right. Okay, now let's look at the second part of this topic. Being linked with economic inequalities related to a class-conscious world. Here we see our paradox. How can you have environmental equity devoid of class bias in a world that is so grotesquely class bias? To help me explain this, I want to show you all a graph, a sophisticated state-of-the-art graphy thingy. Here we go. I call this the short-term impact graph. Here we see the different kinds of impacts that can be experienced by different communities, ranging from mild to really, really bad, and the different kinds of communities that can experience this, ranging from MEDCs to LEDCs. MEDC and LEDC meaning most and least economically developed countries. For this example, let's use the growing problem of plastic pollution in our oceans. So, the LEDC over here, you see, has an extreme impact because plastic pollution in the ocean damages marine cultures as well as fish populations. If this fish was used for sustenance, then that could mean a deficit of fish to feed the population. If it was a tradable commodity, that could mean less trade, less export. People could lose their business, people could lose their jobs, people could be made homeless. This could reduce the standard of living in their country even more than it already is. And this is really, really bad, hence its position on this graph. For the MEDC, however, which did not rely much on the ocean to begin with, the worst that can happen, a drop in tourism. Scary. Now, the aim of environmental equity is to make this line as straight as possible, and as of the present, there are three ways in which we can do this. Here's way number one. In this version of the graph, every community in the world experiences the most extreme effects of environmental changes. Every community, every country, every people, without exception. This is the classic, if we go down, we go down together. Anyway, equally as clearly, this is not ideal. Why? Well. We don't want even more people to suffer the most extreme versions of climate change more than, well, there already are. And remember, we're talking about the whole world here, so, yeah, this won't work. The next version of the graph is here, and this seems pretty good. In this version of the graph, everyone lives like an extreme MEDC. This means they can afford to have excellent education, they can afford to have excellent healthcare, they can afford to live in a place that isn't threatened by environmental hazards. 
on paper or on this wall, this idea looks pretty good. But it can't happen. Why? Because, well, our communities demand resources, resources in the form of raw materials, food, water, electricity, the lot. And MEDCs, especially extreme MEDCs, are some of the most blatant, extravagant consumers of these resources on Earth. So great is this consumption that, according to overshootday.org, if every country in the world were to live like the USA, the United States of America, that is to say, they all use the same resources, the same food, the same water, the same electricity, we would need 5.1 Earths to sustain that. What's even worse is that if every country in the world lived like the UAE, this country, the, U, the United Arab Emirates, a country a fraction of the size of the USA, we would still need 5.1 Earths to sustain that. I went forward, it's fine. Still need 5.1 Earths to sustain that. If we all lived like Qatar, we would need 9 Earths. Now, I'm not here to point fingers. But what this does make very apparent is that we can't live like this. We can't continue to live the way we are currently living because it's just not sustainable. We would be running out of Earth's resources at an even greater rate than we are at the present. So, getting everyone to live like an extreme LEDC can't happen. Getting everyone to live like an extreme MEDC literally can't happen. In hindsight, we probably should have started with the line in the middle to begin with, but we're here now, so... There we go. This is the classic Goldilocks solution of the graph. Not too much, not too little, but just right. So, in this version of the graph, we all use the Earth's resources sustainably. That means we can just rely on this one Earth. At the same time, ensuring that no one experiences the most extreme effects of environmental change. This is a legendary graph. So, how do we achieve this golden state? There are a few ways we can do this, but one of the most apparent would be for MEDCs, some of the most substantially developed countries in the world, to slow down, maybe even pause their development entirely. For the sake of letting these LEDCs catch up, they could even speed up the process by providing help in the form of aid, donations, or even advice. After all, all MEDCs have been in this situation before. Now, you may have realized I'm using the words MEDC, LEDC, resources, development, and other rather commercial terms a lot. This brings me to another aspect of environmental equity. See, as industries have gotten larger and larger to the point of having several multinational corporations, they've begun to touch upon topics that no one really considered could be part of business before, environmental equity among them. For instance, Google. Google started out as an American search engine, a web browser from the USA. Now this enterprise has become so big, so lucrative, that there's barely anyone who doesn't still know what Google actually is. So great are their operations that Google has had to make a separate subgroup to identify and mitigate their environmental impacts. Emirates Airlines started in 1985 with just two aircraft, both of which were leased from Pakistan International Airlines. This year, they have an excess of 260 aircraft. This giant leap in range means that they also need to create a separate subgroup to focus on, on identifying and mitigating their own environmental impact. IKEA started as a Swedish regional business that originally started by selling matchsticks. Today, IKEA, this multinational furniture brand, has become so self-aware that they've created new lines like sustainable resourced wood and recycled plastics and glass, and who knows what else. The point of me telling you this is to remind you that you don't need to be an environmentalist or a biologist anymore to have the topic of environmental equity in your everyday career. Today, you can have a job from plumbing to painting to piloting to, you know, basketball playing. And to basketball playing, thank you. And it'll be in your everyday business because environmental awareness is now starkly in one of the top priorities of any business, whether you are an entrepreneur or hope to join a firm in the future. Younger students, you'll know what I'm talking about because you may have realized that in most, if not all, of your subjects, from English to commerce, there has been a great surge in environment-themed topics in your source texts and your lessons. Therefore, if the early signs are anything to go by, we seem to be heading in the right direction. And really, at this point, we don't exactly have an option because, well, because of this, 2030. It marks the international deadline, the year we need to get our environmental affairs in order. If we let this pass us by, 
if we just let this go without lifting a finger about environmental equity or any of its counterparts, if we're not careful, it might just be our golden crops washed away. It might just be our fish that emerge pre-wrapped. It might just be us in the firing line of that volcano. We know nothing about what that feels like. Thank you.